uh, with a cheer on our face, we say, America, come home. I'm glad we can come home. <laughs> so many thoughts that are given in that regard. If you go with me to, again, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And for the next several moments together, we'll consider the, consider the topic of liberty. Trust that we'll all have a Bible. We'll all be ready. We'll all be attentive. And all ready to hear from God's word. So many things that go on when we come to church, but we're here to worship God. Amen. We're here to worship God. Amen. And I'm going to just keep driving that home. Keep driving that home. We'll begin our reading in verse 1 and read the uh, chapter together here. I'll read aloud if you'll listen with me. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Who also, uh, who hath also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of the condemnation be glory... Much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more than which, uh, that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the, Spirit, now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In verse 17, as we'll take our passage here this morning and take this text, it says here in this verse, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty. I thank God if we have the Spirit of God living inside of us, we have liberty. I remind you this, as we'll talk about this, we go through this message for the next few moments, but we have freedom combined with responsibility that produces liberty. Freedom combined with responsibility produces liberty. We'll talk more about these terms and what they mean, but I do want to say this, uh, something I've written and I want to read to you, but the story of the United States of America is not some scandalous tale. Let me stop and say again, the story of the birth of this nation is not a scandalous tale as some folks may want to have us believe today. The foundations are being, being attacked. There's no doubt about that. And I believe that righteousness ought to be done. That does not mean that we're without failures and embarrassments in this country. But it's not some scandalous tale, uh, but a, rather a statement and a testament to the blessings of God on an imperfect people who purpose to follow the tenets of the Lord set forth in the Bible. I would not, be, I would not pretend to tell you that every founding, so-called founding father was a Bible-believing Christian, but do we at least acknowledge the fact in the, in the context of the age that the Bible was so interwoven into the fabric of the society, though misused and abused at times, like politicians certainly can do today and do today. Be careful about asking too many politicians about their favorite Bible verses. Uh, you could probably Google that and get a lot of interesting answers. They're out there. By the way, I, I need to work on myself and not so much worry about them. But understand that people can take this Bible and use it for political gain. That has happened in this country. I do acknowledge that. But you know what? I'm glad to say this. At least there's a Bible for them to draw from. 
You understand? At least there's an acknowledgement, even by people who may be morally bankrupt, to realize that if they can attach themselves to this, that the American people will at least give them some honor, because there is honor in God's word. And this is our foundation, my friend. I want everyone to understand that. Even if folks have misused it and abused it, even if they've used it as a political tool, at least in that foolish behavior, there's an acknowledgement that there's truth here. Yep. <laughs> And people who want to live righteously will try to live by that truth and not just speak of it for political results and for political endeavors. But the reason people do it is because there is power here. And because even though our country may not be exactly what we've imagined it to be in the past, we do still look back to this Bible and think this is something that God has blessed and this is something that God has given the trouble with every, every politician is the same trouble you and I have ourselves is just doing what we know is in here. But there's not this, the beginning of our country is not perfect. I want to say publicly again, I personally am not happy with the fact that living in the day and age I live in now, if I, lived, if I was a, a resident of this country in 1787 to uh, 1791 and when the Constitution was adopted, I would like to think I would have the same position contextually. I cannot promise you. But I don't like the fact that there was a three-fifth slave compromise added to the Constitution of the United States of America. As I stand here today as a free man, thinking about the fact that there's only one race in the world, that's the human race, Amen. and that, those, that slavery is acknowledged in this book. Slavery is never promoted and endorsed in this book. Right. So I'm not proud of the fact. I consider that a failure of our American a democratic republic that we would have, have done that. I want you to understand this, that in the, in the deciding of the three-fifths compromise, I think you remember from history class. I'm sorry to pull up some bad memories of history class for you. I apologize for that in advance. I'm, I, have a, I have a degree in history. I was a history teacher. So you're, now you understand why my, with the weirdness, I'm sure, a little bit. Uh, Darren, Darren subscribes to a little bit of that as well. Yes, we, we wear the badge proudly. Try to anyway, right? <laughs> Even though everybody else doesn't appreciate it, yes. That three-fifths compromise, I, I, it, it, it absolutely would say that if you were to look at someone, uh, a black person living in America who was living under the, under, the, under the cloak of slavery in that day, that they actually would only count as three-fifths of a person. Uh, th that, that's not true. That was just a political, a negotiated political agreement. And it wasn't so much as about the individual as it was make, maintaining a certain balance of power in the halls of Congress in Washington, D.C. to try to decide how many slave states are there going to be, how many free states are there going to be. It was all about politics. Here we go again. It's all about the politics. But the fallout of that is if you boil it all the way down to the individual where liberty resides and, and opportunity resides and responsibility resides, that is to say to folks, black folks who live in America, then they're only, really only count as three-fifths of purpose person for the purpose of representation in Congress. We have uh, Mr. Bobby Scott representing us in the 3rd District in Congress. He represents about five to 600,000 people, maybe even more than that now. But approximately every person, every, all 335 representatives in the House of Representatives of the United States Congress represent about a half a million to 600,000 people. They go there and they vote on, on, for us. They take care of the nation's business for us. And so we understand that if, there's a, if Virginia has, so I think Virginia has about 9 million people living in our commonwealth. And so you get so many representatives divided up among those 9 million people. And so folks in Congress were concerned that if you, add, if you added the slave population to a state, there are going to be more representation for slave states in the halls of Congress as opposed to free states, and that free states would have a political disadvantage. That's what it all boiled down to. That was a political agreement that was negotiated. I consider that a failure in America. I, I, I try to contextualize that. I understand where people were and where they were going. And, and I, I thank God for the founding of America. By the way, the founding of America was, the, was one of the nails in the coffin for slavery in, in our world. The founding of America was a nail. It wasn't, there weren't, the final nails had to be driven and, and the things, and now it didn't, it didn't eradicate prejudice, but it was one of the nails, one of the final nails in the coffin. Then go and listen to Mr. William Wilberforce in, in England and the work that he did there and all that eventually swept back across the Atlantic in the 1860s in a nation that went to war with itself to eradicate slavery. I, I thank God for that. 
But I understand as we view the beginnings of America, all that is woven into it. I want we 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 would take ourselves back with all the that we have been uh, had the privilege to be educated about and all that we've received in our lifetime and try to put ourselves in that context. Uh, there weren't very many people that could take that experience in that context. I'm thankful that there were people standing. But I recognize when I acknowledge the documents of freedom, that is a part of what, what is in the beginning of America. But I'm glad to know, even though it wasn't a perfect founding, it was a beginning that was not a scandalous tale. It was a beginning where people acknowledged that there was a God. And we were on a pathway to righteous improvement. By the way, that's, that's the story of my life too. How about yours? I'm on a pathway, God willing, to a righteous improvement. And at this rate, I'm going to have to live till I'm about 500 years old to make much progress, right? My steps are way too slow. They really are. But our founders were flawed, but fully aware that the liberty granted by God was extended to all men and women. They therefore established a system that would incrementally recognize freedom from all citizens of the land. Now, it would have been amazing if, if that truly was recognized for all people. By the way, women didn't vote in America until the 20th century. Black Americans didn't have the privilege to vote until after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. And even that was severely abridged with Jim Crow laws until the 20th century. But there's been an incremental improvement, righteous improvement in this country God bless America. <laughs> Not a perfect land, but the land that God's given us and, and at least a recognition of liberty. The gift of liberty freed early Americans to pursue life and happiness within the confines of God's law. And they in turn became incredibly prosperous. That's a benefit. It's a byproduct. The prosperity was inextricably tied to the, their character which they would demonstrate by submitting to Almighty God. Again, not a perfect people, not a, complete, not a 100% saved population. But they understood that God had granted inalienable rights, liberty that came from God. And on this God and country Sunday, we, are, we honor our country. I'm here to stand up and say, I'm glad to be an American. I want to encourage you to understand, you can still say that. You can still say that with the right spirit. We are citizens of heaven. We are Christians first. Amen, Brother Ruby. But God has put us here to be a light, salt and light in this nation. And I, I for one, realize that the key to helping this nation is not to tear it apart. Does this nation need help? Oh, my. And if there's anyone to blame, it's you and me. If we say this nation needs help, there's somebody to blame. It's you and me. Well, we, we just can't stand by. If anything we've learned maybe in the last few weeks, even though we would not go about things with looting and rioting, when a group of people band together to make their voice known, changes can happily, happen quickly. Well, I confess there are a few underhanded things going on in our country to accomplish what's happening. But there has been a moment where people have banded together and struck a note that rings and reverberates in every household in America. What could we do if we band together with the power of God? What could we do? We can honor this nation. We can honor its founders. We honor its soldiers who've enlisted, fought, and died to give their all in defense of our country and for the cause of liberty. By the way, I want to say publicly, our soldiers didn't sign up and fight just to protect borders, although I certainly believe in doing that. Our, our soldiers didn't, didn't sign up and fight just to conquer nations. Our soldiers sign up and fight to defend liberty. That's a much greater cause. That's a much greater cause. We're not involved in just setting up leaders around the world and tearing them down. We're not in, in, involved in that sort of thing for any other reason except liberty. I recognize there are underhanded things going on even in the halls of government and even in some of the, uh, the unknowing things that happen that must happen in our military endeavors. But I want you to understand the cause is liberty. That's what's made this nation different. And because there's a foundation built on God and his word, Liberty was established at creation. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. He wrote it in 1786. This document, by the way, was very influential on James Madison as the Bill of Rights was written just a few years later. Where Jefferson said this, Almighty God hath created the mind free and manifested his supreme will that free it shall remain by making it altogether insusceptible of restraint. That's, that's, that's where our liberty comes from. Your mind is insusceptible of restraint unless you yield it. Mm -hmm. The example that I give of that, I can still remember years ago when our, our, our military was, was much more heavily engaged in Iraq. 
I remember some of our soldiers being taken captive. This has happened many times, and I remember specifically at that time. And soldiers would be put on state TV looking a bit disheveled and a little bit roughed up, and they'd be sitting there, and as they put the camera on them, they would disavow America. A soldier, an American soldier would disavow America. He would disagree with the war effort in Iraq. And I'm listening. I'm like, what's going on here? And I came to realize that soldier was only, only saying what he was demanded to say. What we couldn't see off the screen was a semi-automatic weapon probably pointed at his head. And in his heart, I have no trouble with the fact that he may utter some empty words, but in his mind say, I love America. He may, you know, and we can get an outward conformity from people and never see hearts changed, by the way. Children knows that happens, and they know it happens, and mom and daddies, we know it happens too, right? We can get Junior to do what we want him to do. You know, it's like the little boy that said, you know, when mommy said, and mommy said, son, sit down. And he kept standing up, son, sit down. He kept standing up and finally, she said, son, if you don't sit down right now, you and I are going to have to go to the bedroom. And he finally sat down. And mommy looked at him as his, as he was, steam was coming out of his ears almost. And he said, mommy, I just want you to know that I'm, stand, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm still standing up on the inside. <laughs> still standing up on the inside. Anybody know anybody like that? <laughs> Is anybody a person like that? <laughs> That's where we say, oh, me, right? By the way, if we see it in our children, then we do know where they got it from, right? We, we, we know where they got it from. Their mother probably, right? <laughs> but our mind is free. Our mind is free. And so I, I don't even disparage an American soldier putting those on you. We would say if, if, he had, if he had any courage or conviction, he wouldn't, he wouldn't say this. Well, I understand that. I don't know what I would do if I had a semi-automatic weapon pointed at my head. I'd like to think I'd stand true and say exactly what I'm saying to you right now. But I do recognize this principle, that I have the liberty to be free in my mind even when I can't be free in my body. Ruby prayed it beautifully a while ago. It doesn't matter what country I live in. I have this freedom and liberty granted by God. And a responsibility goes along with it. What is liberty then? It's a right granted by God. To believe and practice, in, in this context, religion without hindrance or coercion by any man or human law. My friend, we choose liberty over tolerance. Tolerance has been the, the word and the buzzword of our day and that for some time now, maybe almost a generation of tolerance. But I want you to know tolerance is dangerous. It's a privilege that's granted by the state which may be withdrawn and it implies the inferiority of the tolerated religion to that which was established by the state. So some people say, we're not going to make too much noise. As long as they let us do what we want to do, we'll give in to the demands. John Bunyan didn't take that to heart. The writer of The Pilgrim's Progress. I encourage you to read that book, that beautiful Christian allegory. If you haven't, probably you have in your educational experience. There are editions for children that I recommend children read. It's a beautiful allegory about our journey with God and what God does. But we would have never had that book and books like The Holy War and other great books that Bunyan wrote if he hadn't spent 12 years in jail. 12 years in jail, what in the world did he get in so much trouble for? Because he wouldn't take a license to preach. He wouldn't take a license to preach. He wouldn't take a license from the government in order to hold assembly meetings. He said this in an exchange with a judge as he went before a judge. He said, only God ordains a man to preach. Yeah. That's a pretty bold statement, but his, his, his conviction was so strong that he wouldn't even take a license. And, the, and they implored of him, son, think of your family. He was a poor man. He was a tinker. He mended pots and pans to make a living. Think, think of your family, the judge said. Judge Wingate said, think of your family. He said, think of your blind daughter, sir, who needs you. And the courage of his convictions. He said, I won't accept a tolerance. I won't accept a toleration. I want to stand for liberty. And that cost him 12 years of his life in jail. God used him. And by the way, who knows, if we, again, whether this is a badge of honor or not, but we still speak of him today. We still benefit from his ministry today because of that sacrifice. That's still a temporal thing. There's eternal value that we seek. But tolerance is not what we're looking for. We're not looking just to let people let us do what we want to do. We're to advocate for liberty this inalienable right granted by God alone and not a, not a privilege that's granted by the state. God help us. Very quickly, let me just speak to you. As, as Again, this is more topical than it is in a contextual understanding of this message, but where the Spirit of the Lord is. Do we have the Spirit of the Lord? Does our country have the Spirit of the Lord? We want it. That's up to us, isn't it? It's up to us as believing people. Believing people. But there is a biblical history of liberty. 
There was a liberty, even in the Old Testament. You say, well, as I read the Old Testament law, I, I'm not so familiar with that. But if you'll think about in creation, I mentioned a moment ago, Adam and Eve had some liberty because they chose to do what God said not to do. They exercised the freedom. They, they had to take a responsibility for that liberty. And they again, sin passed upon all men and women, and they were cast out of the garden. But liberty began at creation. Adam, again, and Eve, Eve being deceived. Adam plunging headlong into sin by choice. Headlong into sin by choice. Uh, and so, ladies, you always remind the men of that. Whenever the men give you a hard time about Eve being deceived... You just remind, remind them that Adam just made just a bare bones choice just to jump in with both feet and to do wrong. Amen, ladies? Amen. There you go. I just want to help you a little bit. I'll tell you what I told the church this morning. I shouldn't be telling things like this on my children, but I'll have to tell you to explain this point, to explain this point. Yeah, my, my children were outside yesterday in the, uh, in the yard working on a project that I had an idea wasn't going to come to pass, but they were working hard at it. They were working hard at it. And it was Nathaniel, it was Carson, it was Jocelyn out there. And eventually Jocelyn came in and she was not happy about the behavior of these two boys. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about, how boys can be, especially when they get together. And uh, she came and said, well, Bubba's doing, excuse me, Nathaniel's doing this. I'm giving away her nicknames here. Uh, Nathaniel's doing this and Carson's doing this and she was worked up about it and I said, I looked at her for a minute I said, honey, will you listen to me for a minute? Yes. Boys have rocks for brains, honey. <laughs> they have rocks for brains. Don't listen to what they say. Don't listen to what they say. They're just trying to aggravate you and the, the only thing they can think about is a way to upset you so they can get their, get their joys out of watching you get upset. That's about it. They have rocks for brains. And then Jocelyn looked at me and said, but daddy, you're a boy. <laughs> I said, honey, I'm a man. Now that, that is, that's all in my past. It's all in my past. And of course, now my wife's here to refute some of that in this hour. She wasn't here in the previous hour to refute that, but uh, she's a really busy lady. You probably don't have time to talk to her about this subject, I'm sure anyway, so. Um, but it's true. But I, 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 Eve was deceived, but Adam jumped in. There was a liberty there to make a choice and he made a choice without even being deceived. Liberty was assaulted by Cain. It was attacked by Pharaoh in the time of Moses when he would not let God's people go. It was prohibited under Nebi, under ba, in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar as the three Hebrew children refused to bow to the image and were cast into that fiery furnace. Thank God the Lord was with them, the fourth man in the fire. And he said, looks like the Son of God. It's interesting. Those words will be printed in the Old Testament. Yeah. <laughs> There's a liberty in the Old Testament. There's a liberty in the New Testament. By the way, as we have a liberty, Christ did teach a separation of church and state, and that's a whole other discussion. But we understand, according to Matthew chapter 22 and verse 17, that we're to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, the things which are Caesar's, under God that which is God's. You remember the account that was given here? It was time to pay the taxes. And did Jesus Christ evade paying his taxes? No, I don't recommend that to any citizen. I don't recommend it to any of us. Uh, I won't say exactly what I think about that, but that's a pretty, uh, well, if you don't pay what you owe, that's, I don't know, that's just not good. I could say a lot of things about it. Doesn't mean we agree with everything. But Jesus didn't evade his taxes, but he did have an unfair advantage. He sent the disciples down to the shore to go fishing and to get his taxes out of the fish's mouth. Do you remember that? He said, look at that coin. Now, by the way, I told men earlier, I said, we could put these fishermen in here to work. We could get all our taxes paid if it worked just like that. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? It's a different idea. But Jesus, they retrieved that, that coin from the fish's mouth. They looked at that coin, and whose picture was on it? Christ's picture wasn't even on that coin. Caesar's picture was on the coin. And I'm not, I'm, not in, I'm not excited about taxes, and I'm sure not in favor of higher taxes. And I have a great concern about how the government spends the tax money that we pay. Yeah. I have great concerns about that. Uh, but I understand this. There are a lot of wonderful benefits. I drove across some wonderfully paved roads this morning on the way here. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I wasn't chipping in on that, they wouldn't be there. Uh, you know, there are other services that I, by the way, that we've got some folks here today that are, are part of the American military. Thank God. Uh, what would they do for a salary? If we just, if we still had a volunteer militia, where would we be as a country? Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm willing to pay some taxes for that. I, I can go on and on down the list. But there is a separation of church and state. We do pay unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, unto God that which is God. The separation of church and state was, that was established in the principles of our documents of freedom, which, by the way, that phrase is not even found in our United States Constitution. It's not found there. 
but it certainly is a principle derived from there that that, that that idea was given in order to protect churches from being infringed on by the government. It wasn't to protect government from the church. But there is a separation there. Paul even taught religious liberty in Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. You say, what's that about? That doesn't sound like religious liberty. Oh, it's much different than the Old Testament. Instead of marking and avoiding, we were taking people out and stoning them. Whenever they caused a division, or whenever they erred from the faith, whenever they didn't follow the true God, that is an indication of liberty. And by the way, there's no basis in the scripture that the government is to protect a religious orthodoxy. It's not the government's necessarily their business to ensure that everybody attends a Christian church on Sunday. That's not liberty. That's not liberty. Every man is responsible. Every man, woman, boy, girl responsible for God to exercise their freedom and responsibility and to choose in the way of liberty to reject or follow God with an accountability. But the government is not the means to ensure evangelism. In fact, government cannot be an evangelist. I remind you of, the, of what I said a moment ago, of soldiers who disavow America while a gun is pointed at their heads. Words are one thing and the heart is something entirely different. And the last thing that a church like this ever wants is outward external conformity without true conversion. Research the Puritans in the halfway covenant when they tied together voting rights with church attendance and they absolutely destroyed the congregational church in New England. Destroyed it. Saying if you're going to be, if you want to vote in, in the election, you have to be in a member and a tender of a local church. That sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? Oh, we want everybody in church. You know what? People started becoming members of church who weren't even converted. All of a sudden, we violated a New Testament principle. We have an unregenerated church membership. And when you allow the unregenerate to, to be a member in God's church, is that, going to, is, is that going to take things up or is it going to take things down? See, we, the business is not to require that. We don't mix that. Those are issues of conscience between people and their God. I'm talking about liberty and what we're after in America. According to the dictates of the Bible, we're not after, we're not after enforcing religious orthodoxy with the power of the state and the power of the sword. I disagree with Augustine completely in that regard. His idea of compelling them to come in was completely different than ours and what the Bible intended. A completely different idea. We compel with love, with the power of the Spirit of God, not with the tip of a sword. No one's ever truly converted at the tip of a sword, I don't think. No one. In fact, if you're not sure about it, you say, well, maybe we ought to just enforce this. And remember that the greatest religious persecutor of all time has yet to be seen, but he will be the Antichrist. Yep. And will use the power and the sword of the state for the devil's purpose in the guise of religion. The book of Revelation warns us about it. There is a biblical history and there's there even biblical, a biblical future that we see about liberty. But there are some principles. I want to say this. Liberty is not lawlessness, a recognition that righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, according to Proverbs 14, 34. Liberty understands that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, according to Psalm 33, 12. Liberty believes also that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God, according to Psalm chapter 9. Liberty understands that we are accountable to the Creator God and we must live according to His established principles if we are to expect His blessings and to avoid His judgment. This liberty that we speak of that's a biblical teaching is based on the priesthood of the believer. Thank God. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19, the Bible says this so much better than I ever could. Having therefore, brethren, boldness enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You and I, my friend, because of the blood of Jesus, are now high priests. We are now, we have the priest, we are a priestly caste. We enter in. We have to go to no one to go to Jesus and no, no one else to go to God. We go to Jesus. He's the one mediator. That priesthood system is gone. You and I now have the priesthood of the believer. We have a liberty granted to us. Liberty is based on the priesthood of the believer bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And listen, we all have an accountability, but thank God we all have a personal illumination from God. 
John 7, 17, I shared with you recently, and I do often, says, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. We can, get, we can know what God wants us to do if we'll make up our minds to obey him. And he, through his word and the spirit that lives inside of us, that spirit of liberty, will guide us into righteous choices as a Christian, as a, as a citizen, certainly, and as a country. And may God grant it personal illumination. And yes, we will have an accountability. We will have a personal face-to-face -face meeting with God. Every one of us shall give account of himself unto God as we think about the principles of liberty. And we think about, we must not forget about the limits of our liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But that, this is not an absolute right. Someone has said, your rights end where my nose begins. And well, that depends. I mean, that may be that some of us feel like we got more freedom than others. I'm not sure how that, that as regards, we regard all of that. But your rights end where my nose begins. I mean, my liberty is not absolute. My liberties cannot infringe on your liberties. One commentator said this. Uh, he said, freedom is, is in danger. By the way, I'll say this. There's no freedom until liberty is joined with responsibility. Freedom, the commentator said this, freedom is in danger of degenerating into a mere arbitrariness unless it is lived in terms of responsibleness. He said, this is why I recommend that the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast be supplemented with the Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. <laughs> I said, that may not be a bad idea. That may not be a bad idea. Uh, one economist wrote these words about liberty. Liberty not only means that the individual has both the opportunity and the burden of choice, it also means that he must bear the consequences of his actions and will receive praise or blame for them. Liberty and responsibility are inseparable. So our liberty is not absolute. Even secularists acknowledge that. But our God understands it, tells us that our faith demands a conformity. Jude chapter, Jude chapter 1 there in verse 3, there's only one chapter in Jude, says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was, which was once delivered unto the saints. We have a body of doctrine that we adhere to and our liberty has to conform to. Our liberty is limited by the teachings of the New Testament. We have all the law, and Jesus said all the law hangs on the fact that we ought to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and love our neighbor as ourselves. Our liberty has some limit to it. Our liberty is limited by its effect on other people. Romans chapter 14 and verse 7 reminds us that none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. Liberty, it, it does have a limit. Thank God for it. And by the way, even if it's not our favorite thing to consider, our liberty is even affected by what other people think. Have you ever heard anybody say, I don't care what they think. If somebody says, I don't care what they think, they actually do care what they probably think. If you have to say it out loud, you actually do. But as believers, I don't think we should ever say the words, I don't care what they think. Because of the influence that we have to affect someone's choices to follow or reject God. Or, checks, or to, to, to influence and affect someone's pursuit of righteousness. Say, well, that sounds good, Brother Greg. I'm glad you think that way. Well, this is what Paul wrote on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit with regard to that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 29. And he continues in verse 32. He says, Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. Why is my liberty judge of another man's conscience? Verse 32, he answers, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Thank God for the liberty. Freedom plus responsibility giving us our liberty. But it does. We do have limits that are appropriate, and even God says that. By way of conclusion this morning, as we come to a close, this quote was given to me, I've said it often, there's a bondage that brings liberty, and there's a liberty that brings bondage. I'm glad that now I'm, 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 a, I'm a bondsman to Christ in the faith, and there's, there's, there's so much liberty there. There's so much joy there. I, I, I might, by the way, the burden of my sin has been traded for the burden of being a part of God's family. It's described that way in God's word. And, and that we thank God we've been exposed to the truth. Is Jesus Christ the way, the truth, and the life? Yes. Is it true what it said in John chapter 8 and verse 32? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Is that still in God's word? Yes. 
So we understand if there's a failure in this country, the spirit of anarchy runs wild, answers are being missed, and then our nation's being torn asunder to some degree, although I think we're, we're so much stronger than we imagine. And I really believe America will show its best because it's being put to the test. I believe it. I believe it. But the truth is what, will, what, will, what people need to hear. And you and I have to take responsibility for getting this truth out. And if people don't know it, we can only say it's our fault. That's all we can say. And we must redouble the effort. We must continue to dig in that people may know the truth and be free. And in verse 36 is also there in the book of John. It says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. You may accomplish a goal. You may rearrange the construct of a nation and still have freedom elude you has been repeated throughout the annals of history because we only find true freedom and liberty in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask you, do you have the Spirit of the Lord? If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you do not. Some of you in this room this morning have taken your liberty as a believer and ran away from God. You've taken that liberty. you foolishly used that liberty. And I call you back to the Lord today. Because of what you heard today, you are now even more accountable. There are people listening to me by means of the live stream. I don't mean to sound rude, but let me say it as boldly as I can. You've taken your liberty and you've run from God and you have more accountability. May God help us to seek him and yield to that accountability. To yield to that accountability. Do you have the spirit of the Lord? You, 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 if you accept that Christ as your savior, the spirit came to live in you. That's the spirit of liberty. Not lawlessness, but liberty. Do you know the liberty that you can have in Christ because of the forgiveness of sins? In fact, your eternal debt has been paid for. How freeing is that? The hymn writer wrote it, free from the law. Oh, happy condition. <laughs> Jesus is mine and I am forgiven. Thank God for that. Do you know that? Are you complete in him? Christ paid the price to deliver us from the bondage of sin. And we can live in an eternal liberty, free to worship and serve him in this life and the life to come. I invite you to Jesus today. And Christians, I invite you to just absolutely, uh, just absolutely give your all to promote the liberty that is in Jesus Christ, to promote the gospel. And this day and age, while we have the privilege, while we still have an opportunity to speak freely, to make this truth known publicly in the spirit of Jesus Christ, with the love of God, you know, I, I'm afraid at times, excuse me, I'm afraid if I say what I know to be right, whether it be publicly or I may do it through social media or I may do it personally with someone, that someone's going to get mad at me. I do find this in life. Most people don't get mad at what you say. Most people get mad about how you say it. Is that true? That's the, that's the biggest trouble we have. If we can have the spirit of Jesus Christ and speak the truth in love, we better do it. We better do it. That doesn't mean that we won't still be maligned and even castigated at times because our biblical worldview is so antithetical to the view of this world. But I say it's time to stand up and be counted. On a God and country Sunday, we ought to thank God that we belong to him first and foremost. And I have a responsibility to do what I can for liberty in any country that I would live in, but God's planted me here with a lot of latitude to speak up for him. And may God help me to enjoin that fight in a greater way even this day for his glory and by his grace. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Thank you for your attention. Do you have the spirit of liberty? Have you been saved? I trust that you'll come to Christ. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called on his name in a sincere way where God could do his eternal work? You say, I sure hope so. Well, I can say this. If you have any concerns, you ought, to, you ought to settle it today. The trouble you're having is not on God's part. It's on your part. It's on your sincerity. It's on your uh, single-mindedness about it. Because if God convicts you of your sin, you ought to ask him to forgive you so that you can have eternal life and that you can serve him today, begin your eternal life today. And if we know the Lord, my friends, I'm, just, I want us, I'm calling us to action for the sake, for the sake of our Lord and for the sake of our country. Will we do it? As we stand together in this time of invitation, and they'll begin to play this invitation hymn.
May God have his way. I've said plenty. We have a privilege to stand now. Let's do it. Let's come to the Lord. If you need to be saved today and want to step out in this room, there's a loving person that will take a Bible and show you how you can know the Lord. If you're a Christian that wants to make a commitment to God, I encourage you to do that at this altar publicly. There's a bit of an accountability in it. But I'd encourage you to do that. The Lord wants you to do it. And I'll say this, our nation needs you. It's not an easy time. Even families have so much division, don't they, on topics like this. Don't stir the pot unnecessarily, but let's ask God for the grace and faith to stand. Amen. We'll sing a verse and a chorus. If God moves, the altar is open. You come, let God have his way. I hear thy welcome voice that calls me, Lord, to thee. precious blood that flowed on Calvary. I am coming, Lord, coming now to Thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed on Calvary. The coming weak and vile, Thou dost my strength assure, Thou dost my vileness fully cleanse, till spotless all and pure. I am coming, Lord, coming now to Thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that Thank you. If you'll lift your head and look.